Hello, and welcome to our homework this week. Uh, this week we're going to be talking about energy pyramids, um, as well as some human interactions, um, and how we're going to be collecting some data from our earthworm habitats that we've been looking at. To get us started, let's look at a trophic pyramid. So, in class this week, we have been using trophic pyramids. Uh, we've made uh, a giant food web, and we're going to be using that pyramid uh, to make some predictions and help explain how energy moves throughout an ecosystem. So when I say a trophic pyramid, I'm talking about a diagram or a model that looks something like this. Um, you have organisms that are at different feeding levels in an ecosystem. Now, trophic means feeding. So over here, this picture of these pigs, they are eating out of a feeding trough. Uh, that trough, that word right there, is the same root word as trough in trophic pyramids. In our last video, we talked about energy and how energy flows through an ecosystem. Now, the majority of the energy is coming from the sun, and some of that sunlight energy is being captured by the primary producers. Some of that energy is lost as heat, so when the primary consumers eat the primary producers, the plants, some of their energy gets lost as well. And so you, at each step, you're losing energy. Um, what we call this is the 10% rule because on average, 10% of the energy of one trophic level gets passed on to the next trophic level. I want you guys to pay attention to models, to the model that is an energy pyramid. Models are used to make predictions. They're also used to explain complex systems. Um, an ecosystem is very complex, but when you're talking about energy flowing through an ecosystem, you can use a more simplified model like an energy pyramid. When you make this energy pyramid, you can describe how much energy is being lost at each step and how much energy is being transmitted along each trophic level. And you can also show how the decomposers cycle the matter back around. If you had a model, you can look at the amount of plant material in an ecosystem, and you can actually use that information, the biomass of the primary producers, to predict how much energy would be in an apex predator. Just by counting up the amount of mass, the amount of weight of all the living plant uh, producers, you can use a pyramid uh, to predict how many deer and elk there would be, how many um, omnivores there would be and how many top level apex predators there would be. So that's the usefulness of a model. However, an energy pyramid like this also has its limitations, as all models do. In this case, the decomposers aren't really represented very well. They're sort of spread out through all of them. And this doesn't show how much energy is going from one trophic level into each decomposers. They're just saying uh, the decomposers are there. We don't know what's happening. This food pyramid, this trophic pyramid, also doesn't show organisms that might fit at multiple levels. At some times in my life, I eat a lot of plants, and so I would be a primary consumer. Occasionally I eat some other animals, in which case I would be an omnivore. The models aren't perfectly clear, but you can get pretty close to being accurate. In class this week, we are going to be analyzing some data, putting it into a model representation in order to make some predictions help us to explain a complex system that is energy flow. So this data comes from this forest called Hubbard Brook, and it's in New Hampshire. Um, some scientists went into this forest and they made a whole bunch of measurements. The way they made their measurements is they calculated how much total energy is hitting that square meter on average for an entire year. And so they made those measurements and this is all of their data what we're going to be doing, we're going to be trying to represent all of this data in a more clear way. Because right now, it's just a bunch of numbers. So what I'm going to have you do is I'm going to have you create a scaled representation. You're going to be uh, making some visual diagram that represent how much energy is in all of these different forms. So the total amount of energy that is hitting any part of the ecosystem is 480,000 kilocalories per meter squared per year. And if you wanted to calculate how much of that energy 
is just being reflected, how much of that light is just reflecting back into space, what you would need to do is a calculation like this, where you would find the percent of that total energy available. You would take one of those numbers for energy reflected, you divide it by the total, multiply it by 100, and you would get 15%. So what I'm saying is that 15% of the solar energy that is coming in is just being reflected back into space. Once you find the percentages for each one of these values, you'll be able to make some sort of graphical comparison that shows how much of the total energy is being used in each of these places. In making these calculations, you'll then be able to better explain how energy moves through some hypothetical ecosystem. Um, and that's the goal for this whole unit, is to be able to explain how energy flows. Hopefully we'll be able to use data to do that. The next unit that we're gonna be moving on to later in the week is going to be looking at human impacts. And we're gonna be using these pictures, using our observations to practice coming to conclusions based on observational data. And we can just look at the pictures right now and we can see that each habitat looks different than all the others. And we can start to make conclusions. You can notice patterns like the habitat four and habitat two with the earthworms, both have much chunkier soil than either of the habitats here that don't have earthworms in them. So we're gonna be using this earthworm data um, and then reflecting on the impacts of humans in an ecosystem. Um, humans have vast, vast impact on ecosystems around the world, especially with logging of forests, uh, farming, waste, mining. When we are making claims, you need to make sure you can support those claims with evidence. So looking back at our earthworms, you can make some very specific claims. One, what's the impact of the earthworms? They change the composition of the soil. They change the soil from being this more packed, dense soil to more rough, broken up, softer soil. That's the impact of earthworms on the non-living dirt. Um, another comparison that you could make is between the two habitats that had organic matter. If we look closer at habitat three, one thing that you can see is that the organic matter is still there. Now compare that to habitat four and all the organic matter is gone. That is because of the earthworms. That would be my claim, that the earthworms digested all of the organic matter and mixed it back into the soil. Another claim that you can make is about what's happening to the organic matter in habitat three without the earthworms. If I zoom in here, you can see that the organic matter in habitat three has this fungus growing on it. That fungus is a decomposer that's attempting to get rid of the organic matter. In habitat four, there is no fungus. So you could claim that earthworms compete with fungus for the nutrients and energy that was available in that organic matter. When you collect data, you can then use that to support claims. You can explain using scientific reasoning what that evidence means and how it supports your claim. You're gonna be doing a similar project over the rest of this year but you're gonna be using broader data. We're gonna be using a website called the NASA Earth Observations to collect some human uh, impact data and make some observations. If you go to this website, you'll be able to see that there is a lot of information in various pictures that we're gonna be using. We're gonna use those pictures to collect data. You guys are gonna be making your own questions and investigating that based on the information in this website. So you can choose lots of different ways that you can compare things. You can compare different uh, places on Earth, different times, um, or even different types of data, whether it's from energy to land in different areas, uh, in order to come to some sort of conclusion about the impacts of humans. Um, our last project for the year uh, will hopefully be on designing solutions to reduce those human impacts. So that's our video for this week. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, as always, be ready to ask some questions. And if you're interested, click on this link right down here to listen to our outro music. It's just uh, another